Good evening, good evening, DMTV, and in particular, our Another Now program that started with the lockdown almost a year and a half ago now. We're back, we're back on air uh, with a very special discussion tonight. Let me preview the next one that's coming up. The next one is going to be with Michael Albert, a great comrade uh, in the United States, um, collaborator and friend of Noam Chomsky, our other great comrade, um, one of the stalwarts of uh, Z Communications and ZNet and Paricon, Participatory Economics. We're going to be discussing post-capitalism. We're going to be discussing participatory democracy, participatory economics, participatory socialism, if you wish. But tonight, tonight we are going to uh, focus our minds and souls on Palestine. I am privileged and uh, very, very, very happy to be presenting to you Omar Barghouti. Omar Barghouti uh, is one of the initiators of the BDS movement. Uh, he has, um, he has uh, been awarded jointly the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award. He's an activist, an intellectual. Uh, above all, he's somebody who has dedicated his life on uh, ending the silence over the crime against humanity, which is being perpetrated in historic Palestine against a people, or actually several peoples, that um, have been caught in the clasps of um, settler colonialism, an apartheid state building exercise, greater Israel, call it what you might. Omar, thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. Um, the floor is yours. To begin with, to report from the ground in Palestine, in Israel, what is the state of affairs at this moment? We know about the uh, ceasefire. Uh, we fear that the ceasefire is simply another way by which uh, the West, uh, the Europeans, the Americans, uh, can yet again forget about the permanent quiet violence perpetrated against people who have to live under apartheid situation, a, an apartheid situation. Uh, and once you tell us about what's going on, uh, we need your lights, we need your advice on how progressives can lend solidarity to the people suffering under those conditions. Uh, thank you very much, Yanis, for having me. I'm honored to be on your show. Uh, the situation on the ground is uh, quite bleak, despite the hope that Palestinians feel. I mean, we have a lot of pain, we have a lot of anger, but most of all, we have a lot of hope, believe it or not. Uh, many of us are very optimistic, despite the ongoing repression, the ongoing theft of land, ongoing apartheid, siege of Gaza, denial of refugee rights, all the symptoms of Israel's regime of military occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, are continuing. Nothing has changed there. So with this ceasefire, we're saying it's time to cease apartheid. It's time to cease settler colonialism because that's the root cause of violence, the violence of the oppressor and the reaction of the oppressed. We want to end all violence by ending the root causes, which is the system of oppression. So the, the situation on the ground now, now as we speak, Israeli forces are arresting hundreds of Palestinian activists in the 1948 area in the present day Israel, Palestinian communities who hold Israeli citizenship. Uh, this is a campaign of collective punishment against our activists, Palestinian activists with Israeli citizenship who have played an enormous role in this comprehensive Palestinian uh, um, popular resistance against Israel's attempts to uh, uh, expel people from Sheikh Jarrah, from homes in, their, in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in occupied East Jerusalem, 
um, in, a, in a continuation of the Nakba, the 1948 ethnic cleansing of, of the indigenous Palestinians, it's an ongoing Nakba. We never finished the Nakba, but it's going on on a much smaller scale. Instead of the en masse ethnic cleansing of 1948, where more than half the indigenous Palestinians were, were expelled, now it's, it's one community at a time, a few houses at a time, a neighborhood at a time, and it's happening all over. It's happening, happening in the Naqab, in the Negev Desert, within present-day Israel, in the Galilee, in Jerusalem, uh, and of course across the West Bank, in the Jordan Valley and, and the so-called Area C of, of the West Bank. So it's happening all over the place, not to mention the siege of, of Gaza. Uh, repression in Sheikh Jarrah is continuing. The repression in Jerusalem, uh, uh, hours after the ceasefire, uh, Palestinian worshippers in Haram al-Sharif, in Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, were attacked by militarized Israeli police, rubber-coated uh, metal bullets, uh, uh, and so on, uh, simply because they raised Palestinian flags. Even the Israeli police did not lie this time. They said, we could not allow them to raise a Palestinian flag. That is the crime. They raised a Palestinian flag. They've asserted their identity as Palestinians, and that's not allowed. So that's the situation on, on, uh, on the ground. What about Gaza? <clears throat> Because in Gaza, we have a different situation to the West Bank as well as to East Jerusalem. Uh, we had uh, concerted bombardments by the Israeli Air Force uh, and, and by other means. Uh, we have seen the, the pictures of devastation. Uh, what's the mood like amongst the population in, in, in Gaza as we speak? It's very complex. It's very hard to put in one word or a few words. Uh, uh, the devastation is massive, you're right. Uh, um, it was a televised massacre. People saw the Israeli massive air force bombing civilian neighborhoods. Uh, some people thought those must be mistakes. No, there were not mistakes, they're by design. Israel has used precision bombs provided by the United States. Uh, uh, the United States, as we know, funds, defends, and whitewashes Israeli crimes. It's, it's a major partner. Israeli crimes. So the, Israel has precisely massacred Palestinians, not by mistake, but by design. Since 2008, Israel, the Israeli military, the Israeli government adopted the so-called Dahiya doctrine. Dahiya refers to the southern suburb of Beirut. In the war on Lebanon in 2006, Israel devastated the southern suburb of Beirut, and people thought that was a mistake. In fact, in 2008, they let the cat out of the bag, and Israel, Tel Aviv University, had this long workshop with the Israeli military, and they announced the Dahiya Doctrine. The Dahiya Doctrine basically says, Israel must use disproportionate force against the civilian population and the civilian infrastructure with massive devastation, so as to make them pressure the resistance to stop. There is no way in an asymmetric warfare, as they call it, to stop this irregular resistance, not an army, it's an irregular resistance, except by making the civilians uh, uh, pay such a heavy price in, in their lives, in their livelihoods, uh, and have a lot of pain, and then they will pressure the resistance to stop. Israel, since 2006, has applied this Dahiya doctrine in all its assaults on Palestinians in Gaza. In 2008, 2009, 2012, 14, and now, in 2021, Israel is applying the Dahiya Doctrine, the Doctrine of Disproportionate Force, which, according to international law, is a crime against humanity. This collective punishment, this, uh, this intentional targeting of a civilian population is an absolute war crime in international law. And Israel is doing that. So Palestinians in Gaza, the 2 million Palestinians, under a siege of 14 years, with very little to, 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 to go with, uh, uh, have yet faced more uh, devastation, more destruction. Uh, the water that's suitable for human consumption is less than 5% of the water supply in Gaza. Electricity comes, what, four to six hours per, per day. Uh, so the, the situation, the health situation, the schools, uh, the roads that were devastated, the infrastructure, the sewage pipes that were destroyed by Israel with the sewage flowing into the sea and into the water, it, it's an absolute devastation. Yet. Palestinians also, we are a strange people, I guess, or, or people have passed through such situations, do still feel a lot of hope. They still feel that Israel 
has has been targeting all these civilian build, buildings and so on, trying to hurt civilians because it has failed to make us surrender as a people. We have not surrendered anywhere, not in Lidda, not in Akka, not in Haifa, not in Jerusalem, not in Gaza, not in Ramallah, not anywhere, not in exile. Palestinians are not surrendering. For 73 years of ongoing Nakba, our resistance is continuing, our popular resistance is continuing, and the movement I, I, I speak for, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement, the BDS movement, as a non-violent form of popular resistance, that's our contribution to our people's struggle for freedom, justice and equality, and self-determination, of course. For those of us who are watching from afar, with bated breath, of course, the greatest fear regarding Gaza in particular, I'll come to the rest uh, of the Palestinian lands later on, but the, the fear that we have, which this time is somehow, some, somewhat ameliorated, but there is a fear there that it's all cyclical, too cyclical, and therefore it, this cyclical nature of events can produce desperation and resignation, even if there is no surrender. And by the cyclical nature, what I mean is uh, years and years of repression, of you know, Gaza being in the largest open prison in the world, uh, suffocation, um, embargo, um, shortages. At, at some point, something happens somewhere, like in Al-Aqsa now, but it could be somewhere else. Uh, and there is, there is a flare-up of hostilities between, let's say, you know, Hamas and the Israeli army. The Israeli army uses this as a pretext in order to destroy Gaza, which had been rebuilt over the last two years after the previous such uh, cyclical episode of destruction. The, pe the people suffer massively. Um, and uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> the people suffer massively. And... Um, it all starts again. Is it a, a danger that our, you know, comrades in Gaza, uh, because of this cyclicality, uh, at some point, while not resisting, not sorry, while not uh, succumbing, while not surrendering, will feel a, cut, a kind of fatalistic um, equilibrium that this is how things will always be, because that would be quite detrimental to the creation of um, you know, a genuine pan-Palestinian movement opposing the apartheid policies of Israel. Well, first on the action and reaction, because m many of the viewers and listeners may sometimes confuse things. Uh, if you listen to the Western mainstream media, uh, Palestinians attacked and Israel retaliated. Israel is always retaliating. It's never initiating. So let's set the record straight. Uh, Paulo Freire, uh, the Brazilian uh, educator, philosopher, once said that with the initiation of oppression, violence has already begun. So violence yeah. is what the oppressor creates. Everything beyond that is a reaction to the initial violence of the oppression. Uh, uh, the oppressed, he said, Paulo Freire said, the oppressed never initiate violence. They are the product of the oppressor's violence. So that's why our position is, as a nonviolent movement that wants to end all violence, we absolutely need to address the root causes. So Palestinians in Gaza, if it were for the devastation only, yes, they would feel totally despondent, totally hopeless, uh, uh, under siege for 14 years, as you said. Israel, at one point, counted the per capita calories going into Gaza. I mean, imagine per capita calories. And one senior Israeli official uh, uh, said, vice, vice class, said, he was one of the top advisors to Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon. He said, we want to put the Palestinians on a diet to bring them to the verge of death, but we don't want them to die. It doesn't look good. Uh, of course, to him, it doesn't look good on CNN and BBC. Uh, but it's bringing them to the verge. That's the criminality. That's the intentional criminality of the Israeli regime of oppression. If it were just to that, yes, if I were living in Gaza, one of the two million Palestinians, mostly refugees, expelled in 1948 from their homes and, and, and farms and lands, I would feel totally hopeless. But Palestinians also feel 
that we are resisting as a whole people, not just Palestinians in historic Palestine, also Palestinians in exile. And this time around, around the world, solidarity is much, much higher. We can go into more details, but to me, as someone who has been following that work and working a lot on the international solidarity with our pe uh, people's struggle for liberation, it is unprecedented. I underline unprecedented. We've never seen the level of solidarity that we're seeing today uh, in the top echelons of, of uh, influence uh, from Hollywood to the music industry, to the uh, sports, to academia, to culture. I mean, everywhere. We're seeing enormous uh, support, trade union support, uh, workers, farmers, unions in India, uh, South Africa, port workers. It's just an amazing uh, uh, level of solidarity, effective, meaningful solidarity beyond the huge marches on the street, which are important, but insufficient. So we're seeing effective solidarity. People in Gaza, little children that you see on TV come out and say, thank you, ex, uh, you know, their, their, their favorite football player in, in Manchester United, or thank you, ex artist, musician, or because they know them by name and, and suddenly they see them holding a sign, Free Palestine, or tweeting Free Palestine. And they feel, you know what, we're, we're winning this. Finally, the world is seeing Israel for what it is, an apartheid state. It's not just Beth Salem, Israel's biggest human rights organization, saying it's an apartheid state. It's not just Human Rights Watch. It's not just so many Palestinians for decades saying it's an apartheid state. Now the whole world is recognizing in the U.S. Congress, the belly of the beast, congressmen and women are coming out and saying Israel is an apartheid state. This is totally new. This is unprecedented in the history of solidarity with Palestine. Indeed, indeed. And I have to say that um, speaking from Greece, where I am, uh, one of the great um, sources of regret personally for the collapse of the government in which I participate in 2015, our surrender to the oligarchy, to the international financial um, cartel, if you want, was that very soon after my colleagues, former comrades, uh, surrendered to the Troika of lenders, to the, you know, the Wall Streets and the Frankfurts and the, the International Monetary Funds and the European Central Banks, very soon after they surrendered to that, they adopted a pro-Netanyahu position. And our prime minister here, a hobnobbed with his friend Bibi, as he called him, representing us representing the people who were always standing with the Palestinians against the, the, the policies of Israel. And over the last few years, Omar, Greece, as you know, has become uh, one of the greatest allies of Netanyahu's Israel with military yeah, alliances. Military, yes, absolutely. Uh, military alliances. Uh, we, are, we are actually now uh, in the process of privatizing lands and factories and so on and selling them to Israeli businesses. Uh, while the Greek government, the dictatorial government in Egypt, of Mr. Sisi, and Netanyahu, uh, they have created a little cartel uh, by which they are going to drill the bottom of the Eastern Mediterranean together with ExxonMobil and Total. Um, or they claim they will. I don't believe they will because economically it makes no sense. But it, it's part and parcel of an alliance uh, that, that, that signals a complete departure from solidarity to Palestine that was, uh, you know, one of the trademarks of the Greek Republic before um, the left, together with the right, went into bed with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. This is a great source of pain for us here in Greece, for us progressives, uh, for supporters of the Palestinian cause, of the cause of humanism, actually across the world, uh, especially during the pandemic, when we could see that Israel in our media was being hailed as the place where vaccination rates were the highest in the world, where we knew that the Palestinians were not being vaccinated, and therefore confirming the apartheid caliber um, structure of uh, the state of Israel. Uh, and so suddenly, speaking selfishly if you want, you know, the conflict in Palestine that we've had over the last weeks actually is a breath of fresh air for somebody like me. Uh, even though, you know, there is untold suffering um, and human loss, at least there is a tidal change, not just in Palestine, but also, as you said, when you have footballers taking the knee. And I hope they do a lot more of that because, you know, Black Lives Matter must extend to the Palestinian cause. 
uh, they had the Floyd George moment, was fantastic, and we all celebrated that, but now that moment has to spill over into Palestine. We need to take the knee whenever there is a match, whenever there is an academic conference in support of the struggle of the Palestinians and progressive Jews to overthrow the state of apartheid in the land of Palestine. Uh, indeed, very much so. The boycott, divestment and sanctions or BDS movement actually calls for basic Palestinian rights under international law, ending the occupation, ending the system of racial domination and discrimination, which meets the United Nations definition of apartheid and the right of refugees to return. Those are the three main constituencies of, of the Palestinian people. Most Palestinians are refugees, whether in exile or internally displaced persons which makes the right of return for refugees the most important uh, part of our platform. So it's it's a very liberal program, if you think about it. It's not a radical, you know, yeah. it's a very liberal program. Our basic rights under international law. We speak the language of universal human rights. Uh, we're opposed to all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism. That's a very, very clear position to us. Uh, and we, we will always defend that as an anti-racist movement, as an intersectional and inclusive movement. We oppose all forms of racism. Uh, we certainly see this moment, as you rightly said, that Black Lives Matter has helped all progressives around the world, in fact. They have shifted the discussion, the discourse, from the symptoms to the root causes. Uh, uh, sy systemic racism is built in in the United States. It's not, it's not a minor issue. It's built in centuries of uh, 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 settler colonialism, of genocide against the indigenous people, and then slavery and the ongoing uh, uh, um, uh, horrific crimes committed against the black community in the U.S. Now they're saying, no, we will not accept just a minor symptomatic change, cosmetic change here and there. We've got to change the system. And part of this is challenging empire. As Malcolm X and many other black leaders and Angela Davis and others have said, you cannot disconnect the two. They're very connected. Uh, do domestic oppression is very connected with imperialism outside. Uh, the Pentagon budget of 750, God knows how much, billion dollars annually, where do you think it's spent? Shouldn't this be spent on hospitals and healthcare and education and so on and so forth and roads, infrastructure uh, uh, and, and helping with the green jobs and the climate justice and gender justice and so on? So I think more and more Americans are getting it. Represent Congresswoman Cory Bush in, in the recent challenge while Israel's massacre was ongoing in Congress said, we've got to oppose apartheid, period. And we should not be funding, sending military funding of $3.8 billion to Israel while it's committing those horrendous war crimes against Palestinians. And she told Biden, if you don't have anything better to do with the $3.8 billion that you sent annually, I do. My constituency can use this money for health care, for social justice, and so on. And so she made this connection in a wonderful uh, way between uh, black justice, the black liberation movement and their social agenda, economic agenda, and empire uh, outside. I think millions around the world are getting this connection. And, and, and I think many in Greece as well, despite the total betrayal of the Greek government, not just to the Palestinians, betrayal of human decency, the betrayal of every concept that Greece stood for at one point. Uh, uh, we think that this military alliance between the Greek government, Cypriot government, uh, and Israel, uh, this uh, gas exploration projects and, and, and trying to tell that we have an alliance with gas while Israel is stealing Palestinian gas. There's the crime of pillage of Palestinian gas. And Greek, Greece doesn't mind, the Greek government doesn't mind, but the people of Greece do mind. We're seeing increasing solidarity, as you said, uh, among uh, the Greek public among uh, social movements and, and, the, and the grassroots, we're seeing increasing support among Greeks for Palestinian rights, as they've always uh, uh, done. I study philosophy, by the way, and, and one of the things we studied that uh, uh, most Europeans don't know that Greek philosophy, after the church you know, destroyed all the, those uh, non-Christian books, it was Muslim philosophers, Arab philosophers, who have saved most of the works of Greek philosophers and the great, the, the great Baghdad translation school. Yes, and without that translation from Arabic to all European languages, Greek philosophy would have been lost. So Indeed. the Renaissance the Renaissance owes a lot to, to, to some of the work that my ancestors had worked on. I mean, the, the relations are very uh, deep 
in, in history. Uh, uh, so it's not only colonialism and imperialism that has come from Europe. There's also a lot of cultural exchange that's very positive. And I think many people around the world do see those positive connections and most importantly, the intersectional struggles. Palestinian liberation today is part and parcel of the progressive movement for, for racial justice, climate justice, gender justice, economic justice. From the Greek perspective, again, let me say that um, we of the left have traditionally cherished two, tra two traditions, two important traditions of the Greek left. One is the manner in which the Greek partisans of the left supported and aided the Jews of Thessaloniki when they were fleeing from the Nazis. And the manner in which uh, many of them joined the ranks of the partisans and others escaped because of the partisans. And at the same time, the second plank that makes us very proud is um, the, the, the fact that the, the, the Greek left has always been uh, building bridges between uh, the ancient Greek world the, in terms of culture, in terms of um, uh, the aesthetic, with the Iraqi Baghdad translation school, the manner in which uh, Muslim scholars uh, transplanted, as you said, uh, basic humanist ancient Greek ideas into Europe via Spain, of course. Uh, in order to honor this, we Greeks have to reclaim that uh, um, mantle from the um, quite despicable and cynical attempts of our governments here in Greece, uh, under, of course, the aegis of uh, the new colonial power, which is, of course, the troika of lenders that has rendered this country a colony, a debt colony. We are a debt colony. Uh, here in Greece, have no uh, doubt about that. Uh, so, to cut a long story short, uh, as you know, I'm leading a political party, a, a young political party in Greece's parliament. It's called Mera 25. On the 4th, 5th and 6th of June, we are going to be having, in next week, uh, our first party congress. And um, as its secretary, I'm going to table a motion for Mera 25 to campaign, firstly, for uh, a boycott, a trade boycott, and a trade embargo of Israel by Greece's trade unions, and hopefully by a Greek government that may emerge in the future that is progressive and on the side of humanism. Uh, secondly, we are going to be campaigning for the recognition of the state of Palestine to give at least uh, equal legal status to Palestine and to Israel, uh, before there is any chance of uh, restarting a process mm. of negotiations. Mm. Uh, this is not the position of MERA 25 yet. I'm going to be ta tabling this motion. I simply felt the need to state it for the record here. Well, thank you very much. This is what we call meaningful solidarity, really, uh, because um, the, the, the Greek government is definitely a partner in Israel's crimes, definitely a partner. This military alliance between the two and the gas alliance, that makes the Greek government a, a, a partner in Israeli crimes against the Palestinian people. And, and Greece in particular had such a long history of alliances across the Arab world, uh, across the world. Greece was never the enemy of any in our region. I mean, it was always a very friendly relationship, but the Greek government is destroying all that and just uh, uh, beholden to US imperialism, to Israel, and as you said, to the financial capitals in Europe. Uh, so I think what you're proposing, and I hope your party does pass that, would be an example for progressive, for leftist European parties. I don't think, as far as I know, any other political party across Europe has done that yet. Palestinian trade unions, all of them, have called a couple of days ago on all trade unions around the world to show us true solidarity by refusing to handle Israeli ships, uh, loading, offloading, especially military uh, uh, weaponry and, and, and so on, by refusing to deal with Israel, just as was done against apartheid South Africa. Trade unions led the struggle against uh, South Africa. It wasn't just artists and academics. It was also trade unions that led the struggle in Europe 
uh, to exactly. end the complicity with apartheid. So it's all about complicity, Yanis. It's, it's one key principle is do no harm. I know it comes from the medical field, but also yeah. in our work in human rights, we say do no harm. If a government is doing harm by partnering with Israel, by doing trade with Israel, selling weapons, buying weapons, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, like Greece is, then the citizens of the country have a responsibility to act, to do no harm, to cut the links of complicity. So imagine if the countries, the United States or the UK or France or Germany, that are much more deeply involved in maintaining Israeli occupation and, and, and uh, apartheid. I believe it was Edward Said who once said that um, the Americans are not going to liberate themselves until the Palestinians liberate themselves. <laughs> um, and that applies to us Europeans as well, you know, because uh, think of what happened, what befell my comrade and friend Jeremy Corbyn in the, Uni in the United Kingdom, uh, simply because he refused to endorse the pro-Israel, the pro-state of Israel groups um, demand that he declares um, a co an identity between uh, um, opposing Israel with anti-Semitism. Uh, th these same pro-Israel groups uh, want to treat us all, every single one of us in Europe, uh, like they treated Jeremy Corbyn, to demonize him as uh, an anti-Semite, unless we fall silent as Israel once again continues to brutalize Palestinians. And we're not going to do that. Um, I will wear the Star of David in my heart every time, at any time, uh, a Jew feels persecuted. We will stand next to them like the Greek left stood next to them when uh, the Nazis were persecuting the uh, Thessaloniki Jews. But at the same time, we'll be damned if we stay silent while the Palestinian people are being brutalized. But Omar, let me ask you, um, can you share with our audience uh, a brief history of BDS, of your, the movement that you helped co-found, or find, found, um, uh, boycott, um, disinvest, and sanction? Sure. BDS was launched in 2005 by the absolute majority of Palestinian society in historic Palestine, as well as in exile. So it's a consensus movement. The coalition of political parties, all trade unions, women's unions, youth, academics, farmers, artists, everyone uh, has participated in this movement since it's, uh, it was launched in 2005. But it wasn't uh, uh, something that came out of the blue. It has very deep roots in Palestinian nonviolent popular resistance that goes back to the 1920s against British imperialism, British colonization of Palestine, and later uh, Zionist settler colonialism. In, in Palestine. Boycott has always been used by Palestinians as a key form of popular resistance. But it's also very inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement and by the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and so on. Still till today, Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives in the US is a key inspiration for our uh, uh, work. So BDS calls for three basic rights, ending the occupation of 1967, Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, ending the system of racial domination and discrimination, which is apartheid, and the right of return for refugees, basic Palestinian rights under international law. The movement is intersectional. It sees that the struggle for Palestinian liberation is interconnected with progressive struggles across the world. It's not isolated from them. We cannot liberate the Palestinians by ourselves. We've got to connect with progressive movements worldwide, first on principle and second, pragmatically because we cannot win against a very unified uh, far right, xenophobic right, financial right that's growing around the world. W without unity, there's no way to fight as progressives. There's no way to win against uh, uh, the very vicious uh, capitalism, imperialism, and, and it's very militarized uh, manifestation uh, today. A very important part of BDS is that we're anti-racist, as I mentioned earlier. We oppose all forms of racism. So as you mentioned, that we would stand with any Jewish person facing persecution, absolutely. We would support that and we would stand against any attack on a person because he or she is Jewish. We absolutely categorically oppose anti-Semitism because we, we never accept that Israel equals all Jews. In fact, that equation is anti-Semitic. 
making all Jewish persons equal Israel means there's no Jewish diversity. That's a very anti-Semitic premise. And that's Israel premise. That's the Zionist movement's premise, that all Jews equal Israel. Israel is equal, it speaks for all Jews. So that's a very anti-Semitic uh, formula. Since its, it, its launch in, B, in 2005, BDS has achieved quite a lot in the academic sphere, cultural, economic, financial, sports, and so on. Uh, rather than spend a lot of time, I'll just give very few examples. Uh, some of the biggest companies in the world, Veolia, the French company, was kicked out of its Israeli business in 2015. We, we managed the BDS movement after a seven-year campaign that cost Veolia over 20 billion, with a B, 20 billion dollars over a seven-year period. It lost contracts in Sweden, the UK, Ireland, the US, Kuwait, and across the world. Ultimately, shareholders of Veolia decided enough, let's pull out of those Israeli projects that violate international law. It's not worth it. They pulled out. After Veolia, several companies pulled out of the Israeli market because of BDS campaigning against them. Uh, um, that's one aspect. Another aspect is major sovereign funds, pension funds, like the Norwegian pension fund a few days ago. The Norwegian pension fund, the biggest sovereign fund in the world, worth $1.3 trillion, divested from two Israeli companies because of their in involvement in the occupation and settlement business and war crimes. Uh, the United Nations has issued a database of companies that are involved in the settlement industry and increasingly sovereign funds in New Zealand, in the Netherlands, in Norway and major churches in the United States are divesting from some of those companies. And some companies are not on the UN list but are complicit like HP, Hewlett Packard, AXA, CAF and we're going after them. Going after them, meaning we're, we're pressuring city councils to exclude them from tenders. We're pushing people, uh, investment funds to exclude them from investments and so on and so forth. In parallel with that, we do a lot of work on academic sphere, cultural sphere, but to explain, though we are inspired by the South African boycott, there's a huge difference, Yanis. In the South African boycott, which I was part of when I went to school in the United States, we boycotted everyone and everything South African, as you would remember. That's what the ANC called on us to do. We follow the lead of the oppressed. In the Palestinian-led BDS movement, we don't call for a boycott of Israelis. We call for a boycott of institutions that are complicit in Israel's violations. We don't target Israelis. We don't target identity. We target complicity. And that's a very, very important difference. We have many Israeli partners, Jewish Israeli partners in the BDS movement. Boycotts from within is a group within Israeli society that calls for BDS. Not to mention the many, many Jewish partners around the world, the biggest of them being Jewish Voice for Peace in the United States, the fastest growing progressive Jewish organization in the world. And we're very proud of that. So we work in the Arab world, in the global south, across the world with many partners, especially the largest trade unions. And just to end this point, just to give the Greek audience and, and European audience an example, maybe it will make some Europeans more modest. Uh, the biggest farmers union in India with 16 million members has endorsed BDS. The largest progressive women's coalition in India with 10 million members endorsed BDS. And the largest student union in India with 4 million members endorsed BDS. Just think of those numbers. Quite impressive. By the way, you reminded me uh, when you said that not all <laughs> Israelis are complicit in uh, uh, the Israeli state policies. You remind me of, you know, something that one of my heroes said, Hannah Arendt, uh, about the Nazis. She said, as long as one German resisting the Nazis died in Auschwitz, she does not consider the Germans to be responsible for Auschwitz. And I think that the, you know, that, that is the essence, the essence of separating the struggle against state policies from the need for solidarity with every people, including the people uh, in whose name the appalling policies are being exercised. I have a question here for you from Haman Imadi. Uh, I think it's a good one to help clarify something. You already said it, but once more. Um, is the BDS uh, project meant to target industries in the illegal settlements or all of industry in Israel? Okay, there's the principle and there's the strategy. The principle is it's a boycott divestment sanctions against Israel because it's a regime of occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, just as the boycott targeted South Africa. 
we don't target individuals, as I said, but we target the state of Israel and we target institutions and companies that are complicit in Israel's violations, whether Israeli companies or international, Israeli banks or international banks, Israeli universities or international. So, so we would target any and every company and institution. But then it becomes a, a matter of str strategy. Uh, in a country like Germany, for example, it's very difficult to call for a boycott of a major uh, uh, company just because it's doing business with apartheid Israel. It's supporting apartheid in general. It's easier, not easy, nothing is easy in Germany for Palestinians, but it's easier to call for a boycott against Puma, a German company, because it's involved in supporting the Israeli Football Association, which has six teams in the settlements, illegal settlements. German policy says settlements are illegal. And since the IFA, the Israel Football Association, includes and insists on including six uh, uh, teams from settlements, then Puma should not sponsor the IFA. It's simple. It's simpler. Nothing is simple, as I said, in Germany. But it's simpler to explain. But that's a matter of strategy. In Johannesburg, we call for a full boycott of Israel because it's Johannesburg. That's where support for Palestinians is enormous. In Ireland, we can go much higher than we go in France, for example. So it's a matter of strategy in Brazil, in Chile, in India, uh, Korea, and so on. In the case of South Africa, which of course is different, but at the same time, there is a parallel, a clear parallel, in the sense that only in South Africa and in Israel have we had the practice of apartheid with scientific precision on the, <laughs> on the part of those who are, who are imposing it. Uh, I remember, you know, you were part of the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. I was part of the anti-apartheid movement in the United Kingdom. Now, I remember uh, when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister and she was actually supporting the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela. She actually yes. called him a terrorist. Yes. And I remember yes. we were gathering at Hyde Park uh, um, in support of boycotting uh, culturally South Africa in terms of sports, but also uh, an embargo on trade with South Africa. And I remember the standard argument against us back then was that this is what's going to hurt uh, you know, the, the weakest members of the South African society, to which, of course, the answer was, uh, but they're asking us to do it. It's the ANC that is asking us to push for a boycott because they think that it is like in any case, in any case of industrial strike, in any case of war, uh, liberation war, there has to be a short-term cost in order to achieve long-term liberty. Um, how does this apply here in the case of Israel? What? Are, how can we, you know, tell Israelis, progressive inter Israelis, Israelis who may have not thought through exactly what's going on in Israel and who need us to educate them? and to bring them on our side, how can we convince them that BDS is the right way to go? I think there, there's a parallel, two parallel tracks, I, 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 I think. It's pressure. Any settler colony will not cede, will not uh, uh, surrender its colonial privilege without pressure. Never happened in history, will not happen in history. It has to be through pressure. And we think this pressure is this globalized Palestinian intifada, if you will, internal popular resistance and external solidarity that's effective, that's meaningful, not just rhetorical, meaningful solidarity, cutting the links of complicity in every field. Together, we can exact a much heavier price on this settler colonial project on the apartheid regime so that it feels more uh, the cost of its crim crimes against Palestinians. Without paying that price, most of Israeli society will continue on the path of absolute fascism, as is happening today. The absolute majority of Israeli society support a very fascist position against Palestinians. And I'm using fascist very carefully. It's the textbook definition of fascism. Main leaders, mainstream leaders in Israel today, openly, on air, on broadcast, say we should wipe out Gaza. Two million Palestinians they're calling for genocide. It's a genocidal tendency within Israel at the mainstream. We're not talking about the fringe. The, fr the fringe is in, 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 the, in the Knesset. The fringe is in the uh, uh, Israeli cabinet. It's no longer a fringe. 
uh, the, the entire spectrum in Israel has shifted to the far right and to the fascist right. Today, fascist parties are represented in the Knesset openly, without any problem. And they played a very important role in the repression, in the, in the murderous repression in Al-Aqsa Mosque, in Sheikh Jarrah and everywhere else. Uh, they were involved in this. So the, the parallel track is our Israeli partners, our progressive anti-Zionist Jewish Israelis are working within Israeli society to win support for a better future for everyone. They're saying other than our internationalist solidarity, our, other than our principled standing with the Palestinians, as we are the oppressors, we want to end oppression, it's good for the Palestinians, but it's also good for us. An average Israeli today thinks where his or her children will serve in the army, how many Arabs they will kill. This is the dinner discussion, because they all serve in the army, ultimately. Is that a life that anyone wants? Wouldn't a normal Israeli want to have a normal life? A normal life does not come until you, until you end oppression. So pressure from within and pressure from without. Uh, 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 this, this internal resistance, as well as very meaningful solidarity, as happened in South Africa, together they can push more and more Israelis to the progressive anti-Zionist camp. Was it not uh, Georg Hegel who said that no people can be free if they enslave another? Um, this is yet another reincarnation of that dictum. Uh, Omar, the standard argument from the Israeli side or pro-Israel state uh, commentators is that uh, the Palestinians have failed to um, represent themselves. They point to the divisions between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, to the loss of authority of the Palestinian Authority within the West Bank. Uh, I was listening to a BBC Radio 4 program, and I usually like that particular program, and they had an analysis of Hamas, which was striking to me. I mean, I just heard it this morning, and I was completely struck by the capacity of the BBC to be completely objective, to say nothing which is wrong, and yet to present a completely false picture. <laughs> <laughs> on the basis of you know, many truths that are put together. The one thing they forgot to add to the story, it was a story of Hamas, how it came, they completely neglected to mention that the Israeli state, state assassinated every leader that reached out to them um, and humiliated those who, whom they didn't assassinate. And therefore, you know, that if Hamas is getting stronger, uh, and the Palestinian Authority is uh, is losing its uh, grip on the situation. Um, this has to do with a very concerted effort by the Israeli state, the fact that to, to annul um, legitimate um, Palestinian representatives mm -hmm. of a humanist position. Well, those who say we cannot stand with the Palestinians because they're divided, this is as old as colonialism. This is from the beginning of history of colonialism. They've always used that uh, against indigenous populations. Yeah, they're divided. They don't agree. They, they're not worthy of democracy uh, and self-rule. You know, we, the white West, have to civilize them and we have to rule over them because we are humans and they're subhumans or what I call relative humans. Uh, so this is as old as, as uh, the history of colonialism. And Israel as a, a, a settler colony that has gained a lot from European settler colonialism, that's where Zionism grew as a settler colon, colonial ideology. They bring the same language. Ah, the Palestinians are divided. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve that. Uh, but again, to end the system, we've got to end complicity. And in the European case, this means a military embargo. This means at the very least suspending the EU-Israel Association Agreement because Europe considers, yeah, the US is the naughty one, right? It's the partnering, it's sending Israel all these weapons. Well, so is Germany, so is the UK, so is France. They're all guilty. The EU is also a partner in crime, but unlike the US, which is honest, it's a partner in crime and it's honest about it, the EU is a hypocrite. The European hypocrisy is raised to the level of art it's unbelievable to talk about human rights. We also but buy military technologies from Israel. Buying huh? and we selling buy and, military, and military funding, technology from funding the military research, Yanis. Hundreds yeah. of millions of do European tax dollars are spent on Israeli research to develop weapons that are field tested on Palestinians. 
how more criminal can the EU get? And the gas projects and the buying settlement goods. The EU imports hundreds of millions of dollars of settlement goods, let alone Israeli goods. Settlement goods. The Irish government, the hypocritical Irish government, would not pass a law that says ban goods from settlements from entering Ireland because Ireland considers settlements illegal. All of the EU, the international law. But the Europeans, when it comes to Israel, it's as Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa once said, Israel is put on a pedestal in the West, above international law, above everyone else. So who's singling out Israel? It's the EU. They're singling it up as above international law. We want to bring Israel off the pedestal so it's treated like every other criminal state, every other apartheid. Indeed, indeed. Uh, let me come to a rather sensitive issue, but I think a crucial issue that we cannot skirt around. One of the great achievements of BDS that you represent is that for the first time in decades, you managed to unite different uh, voices, different political movements, different points of view within the Palestinian communities, not just community. Uh, and you are here today mainly representing BDS. But you are also here as Omar Barghouti. <laughs> and I want to use this opportunity uh, to ask you, not as a representative of BDS, but personally, to comment on some of my own concerns, concerns that I've had ever since I got to know Ed, Ed Said many, many years ago, uh, when he was the first one amongst with other uh, friends, um, actually Israeli progressive comrades, uh, who, who were warning me from 1993-1994 that the Oslo Accords could not produce uh, a settlement that would be consistent with humanism. Uh, and they were arguing, you know, as you know, Ed Said was arguing for a one secular democratic federation, federal state or state. Um, I wasn't convinced at the time, I have to say. Uh, I was still dedicated to the idea of a Palestinian state as the incarnation of the urge and the need uh, and, and, and the psychological importance to Palestinians to identify with their own state. Uh, but especially after you know, decades of um, settler colonialism of 600,000, however many hundreds of thousands um, and, you know, settlers we now have illegally, but nevertheless we have in uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and so on. Is it possible to have two states to imagine even? I mean, it, what, all solutions are going to be difficult and cannot be realistically imagined at the moment. But can we imagine having non-sectarian states sitting, standing, sitting side by side, even if Palestine were to be created? If Palestine is going to be created as a viable state, you need to uproot hundreds of thousands of illegal settlers and push them into Israel. What happens with the, um, the Palestinians who are still in pre-1967 Israel? Do they move? Is there an exchange of population? I live in a country that is still scarred by the exchange of populations between the, the Turks and the Greeks in, in the 1920s. Uh, it was a crime against humanity, that, that you know, shifting of populations. Um, are we going to end up with two states, each one of them being an apartheid state, where the minority is going to be a second-rate citizen? Um, what's your feeling about that, as Omar Barghouti, not as BDS? Sure. Yeah, it's important to repeat that because I know what will happen after this interview. Um, the Israeli propaganda machine will say, oh, BDS said so. No, this is not BDS. Now I'm talking in my personal capacity. The BDS movement, for the record, has never taken a position on the political outcome of this uh, struggle. On, because self-determination means Palestinians get to decide our future. It's not up to Europeans, Indians, South Africans, Americans, or anyone to decide for us. It's up to Palestinians to determine our future. That's what self-determination means. And ultimately, Palestinians will decide. So the BDS movement as the biggest coalition in Palestinian society everywhere, includes all political views and does not take a position. As for me personally, since 1983, it's been quite some time now, I've adopted uh, the position that we've got to establish a democratic single state, uh, non-sectarian single state, that, uh, 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 that provides equal rights to everyone, including, and this is the key, Palestinian refugees. The, the issue of Palestinian refugees is the litmus test 
for justice and sustainability of any solution. Without their return, the right of return of Palestinian refugees, there is no justice and therefore there will never be peace. It's as simple as that. So any solution that erases the, the main outcome of the Nakba, which is creating the world's largest refugee population, sustained refugee population, is, is a no starter. That, that's not a just solution. And therefore it's not an ethical solution. As someone working on ethics, philosophy, I focus on ethics, the most ethical solution is one that would give Palestinians uh, uh, the basic justice, the right of return, dismantling the system of settler colonialism and apartheid, and then have equal rights for everyone. I think now, as you said, it might look like a dream. Are you like uh, romantic? No. It, if we take a snapshot of reality now, yes, it looks like so far-fetched, but who would have thought in the 1985, when I was still at college in the United States, that apartheid would collapse in 94, that Mandela will be elected president. When asked whether I thought apartheid would end in my lifetime, when I was striking with the students, blocking Columbia College to force our university to divest, I said, no, I mean, apartheid is so powerful, supported by Thatcher and Reagan, it's impossible. All these big corporations, you know, the banks and Coca-Cola and General Motors, it's impossible. But I'm doing it out of an obligation, ethical obligation. But That's it right. did collapse in my lifetime. And there is no reason to, to believe that uh, dismantling Israeli apartheid will not. Yes, it can happen in our lifetime. And we are gathering grassroots power to make it happen. And this does not need to be bloody or, or kick anyone out. This means ethical coexistence with justice. Ethical coexistence is exactly the project of my life, the intellectual project of my life that I'm doing a PhD on, ethical decolonization. That's exactly what I'm doing. So no one throws anyone out. It's dismantling the structures, the power structures of apartheid and, and settler colonialism so that Palestinians can have justice and average uh, Jewish Israeli can have a normal life, not as an oppressor and not as oppressed either, as a normal citizen of a joint common state with equal rights for everyone, including the refugees. That's my personal position, again, not the movement's position. I, I feel the need to commend mm -hmm. you on this because it, it, it really gives me hope because the civil liberties project can really create the kind of international coalition that is necessary in order to bring about change in Palestine. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a battle that, you know, was fought and somehow won to some extent in the United States in the 1960s. That's what, that was what the civil liberties movement was all about. It was about ending the Jim Crow laws, ending the apartheid, which was practiced in the southern states. Americans, I think, can understand that. What they do not have at the moment, because of the media, is a capacity to know what apartheid looks like in Palestine. They do not know, for instance, that somebody who you know, lives in Bethlehem and works in Nazareth has to be humiliated for six hours a day, between four and six hours a day, um, two hours or three hours going to work, passing through the Israeli checkpoint, and another two, three hours coming back. Um, I, 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 you know, it's or, or that if you're indigenous Palestinian, if you're not Jewish Israeli, you cannot own land on 93% of the land controlled by Israel. Forget the occupied territories. We're talking about present day Israel, pre-67. If you're not a Jewish Israeli citizen, you don't have the right to own land on 93%. You're treated as a second class citizen and you're the indigenous population. Uh, uh, so, so this is the apartheid reality. And, and to solve that, it's not enough to get political dismantling apartheid politically. It's very important that economic justice is also there. Social economic justice is a part and parcel of any ethical solution in the future. It cannot be that you get the vote, but you know we still control the economy and everything else. No, that doesn't work. Reparations, justice, and social economic justice, that's what it means. Omar, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Uh, DiEM25's members and friends uh, owe you a debt of gratitude, uh, both for the yeah. one hour you spent with us, but also for the struggles that you have been part of. Uh, I personally want to thank you and all your comrades at BDS 
for um, you know shining a, a very precious and very rare light uh, in that dark corner of the world that um, uh, is the source of so much tumult across the world, not just the Middle East, but you know I will repeat what Ed Said said: the American. People, the people of America will never be liberated until the Palestinians are liberated. The people of Europe will never be liberated until the Palestinians are liberated. In precisely the same way that uh, we could never have liberated ourselves unless the Jews were emancipated and saved from uh, the persecution of the Second World War, of the pogroms before that. All assaults on a people all settled colonialisms, whether they're in Bangladesh, in Cyprus, in Kashmir, uh, every single misanthropic turn is uh, a stigma. It is uh, a source of unfreedom and instability for the, for the whole of humanity. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yanis.